Turn in your Bibles with me now to Matthew chapter 5. We've been asking together, why does Jesus matter today? Why does Jesus matter today? Today, we're going to see Jesus offers the world true blessing, true blessing. Before we dig into that, just a couple of notes on Matthew that might help us read it well. Um, I had a seminary professor who uh, taught me that I should never begin a sermon with explanation, and so I'm going to risk breaking his advice. Another seminary professor said, dare to be boring, and so I'm, I'm trying out his advice today. And uh, Matthew, you'll find as you read it, begins with an introduction, a couple chapters where you find out who Jesus is. Jesus is the promised king, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is God with us. He is true Israel who came to fulfill Israel's role, God's people's role that they failed to fulfill over and over again. This is who Jesus is, the son of God. And then you find five blocks of narrative history and uh, teaching. So you'll, you'll have a little narrative history of Jesus like in chapters three and four, you see a little bit about the things Jesus did, things that happened to Jesus and so forth. And then beginning in chapter five, we see a long block of teaching. There's five of these blocks of history and teaching. And a lot of commentators think that that corresponds to the five books of Moses and that Matthew is trying to show Jesus as the new Moses, the new authoritative teacher and prophet. And that's very possibly true. And we see Jesus come in authority and in his glory here at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. It could probably just be called the Sermon on the Hill, um, but uh, they didn't have mountains like we have in Colorado in uh, ancient Palestine. Nevertheless, Jesus came to offer us true blessing, and he's going to talk about that in this Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount could be worthy of 18 weeks, 24 weeks, 30 weeks, more but we're going to try to walk through these chapters in six weeks together, staying focused on the big picture of Matthew's gospel. And so it, rather than going along the trail and, and appreciating every individual rock along the way, it's more like we're going to be taking a helicopter ride to different bases along the trail and looking around as we go, looking at big picture. Today, Jesus begins with blessing probably one of the most misused and misunderstood God words that is out there today. Blessing, hashtag blessed. I think of an Instagram account called Preachers and Sneakers. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, Instagram's a social media platform. And uh, there's a person who started a page on Instagram taking pictures of popular evangelical pastors you call them megachurch pastors, perhaps. It takes a picture of their shoes or another article of clothing they're wearing, and then off to the side of that zoomed-in picture of their shoes, you'll see a page where you see what that retails for, and you'll see wherever you know they they shop to get those sorts of uh, shoes or whatever. So Air Jordans, uh, if you if you remember uh, back in the '90s, Air Jordans were were a thing. Well, they're still a thing, and they're a fifteen hundred dollar thing that some of our dear neighbors uh, wear uh, when they get on stage to preach about Jesus, the homeless itinerant preacher who gave his life, was persecuted unto death, and called people to take up their crosses and follow him. Air Jordans. And uh, another preacher you might see on the Instagram account is wearing these big sneakers that have capital letters Prada, Prada, and um, $800, big belt buckles. My favorite was this fanny pack that cost like 600 bucks. Um, why not? The point today is not to become critical about what other people wear. I was nervous about that, and so I went and I looked at Target, and these retail for about $30. So, <laughs> but seriously, the point is not that we become critical of one another and what we wear and the decisions we make about clothing. The question that this raises is what are we communicating about the true blessing of heaven when we have a picture of our $1,500 Air Jordans and then hashtag blessed? People like me, 
people who are called to communicate the blessing of heaven when we are communicating with the things we wear, that the blessing of heaven comes with Prada. What are we communicating? I think the thing that I see, not only in those preachers, but the people who fund and click on those preachers, is that we love the same things as everyone else around us. We value the very same things as the world. There's nothing distinct about us. We like Prada and looking cool and wearing a a, a hooded sweatshirt that costs $1,200 because we want this sense of having arrived and other people thinking that we're hashtag blessed. We love that. But imagine Jesus alongside one of the preachers and sneakers pastors. Imagine him in the the garbs of poverty with stinky sandaled feet and a grisly beard that hasn't been washed well. He doesn't even have suave shampoo, let alone whatever other kind of shampoo, right? Jesus, who doesn't know where to lay down his head, and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, come, take up your cross and follow me. He invites you to come after him. And I could just see many of us today who see another picture of blessing, another picture of hashtag blessed, and we see Jesus, and we're like, I don't really like this one over here. I think I like this one over here, but I want to keep Jesus just in case. So I'll, you know. The thing that Jesus came to do that we see in the Sermon on the Mount is he came to truly bless, to offer true blessing. But what is that? What is that blessing of heaven that he came to give? Well, when he comes to the crowds, these people who are teeming to see him, there was something about Jesus that drew them. Jesus, if you remember, in the previous chapter leading up to this, Jesus was out among people who were hurting, people suffering, people in darkness, And he would look at someone who was blind and be up close with them. And he would lay hands upon their eyes. He would be with someone who had mental brokenness and different kinds of disability. And and he would be with them. Somebody with leprosy, a skin condition that was contagious. He would embrace them and make them clean and whole. And not in a kind of like, you know, with embrace. Jesus welcomed these to himself. He had a character that was different. He had a gospel that was different. He came preaching and healing. And all these people come to him, and he sees them and graciously sits down. This one greater than Moses opens his mouth and teaches them, and he opens his mouth, and the first word he says is blessed, blessed, Blessed. What, is, what does this mean? What does it mean to be blessed? Well, the standard Greek dictionary sort of definition of the word here that Jesus used, it might be something simple like happy, fortunate, good on you. You are to be congratulated. But what is the character of that sort of blessing? Why would we say that someone who looks to Jesus and his kingdom is blessed? We'll get there in a moment. The ones that he called blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. These aren't ones who are lacking in energy. Sometimes you say, oh, that dog's got spirit, or something like that, because it's really energetic. He's saying those who spiritually know that they have nothing before God. Beggars of soul who are looking to God with open hands, poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven right now. They have treasure, unspeakable treasure. And the people were drawn to Jesus. And perhaps for the first time in their life, someone, 
Think about the people he's speaking to for a moment. We're not talking about people who live in northern Colorado in 2021, living in middle class and upward levels of comfort. (laughs) We're talking about first century people, many of them struggling, many of them afflicted by demons, many of them culturally on the outs with the Jewish people. And the Jewish teacher, the one greater than Moses, sits down and says to them, blessed, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps the first time in their lives, this moment is when they knew they were blessed. Quasimodo, if you remember his story, if you like big books, uh, you might have read Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Maybe you're like me and you've seen the Disney movie. And you know that Hugo, or pardon me, that, uh, that Quasimodo is... He's, he's not somebody who you'd be drawn to for his looks. You might be repulsed. You'd be scared of him if you were a child. He's, he's hunchbacked. He seems strange. People would not want to look at him, and he didn't want people to look at him because of the kinds of looks that he got. And yet there was something about him that when people were around him, and you see Esmeralda's character getting to know him, there was a kindness, there was a concern for others something different about him that drew her to him. And he would so readily receive love. He knew he didn't really deserve it, but oh, when it came to him, he was glad. There's something here in this picture of Quasimodo, that kind of a character that kind of sums up this idea of poverty of spirit We who are truly blessed, you who are truly blessed, the one who's truly blessed is one who may be ugly to the world. They may not have preacher shoes. They may not not even have target shoes. They are people who look to God knowing they don't deserve him and yet knowing that he would gladheartedly give himself to them. I have nothing and yet... Right there, I know that the Lord would give himself to me. I am my beloved, beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And the, the, the really amazing and confounding thing about this is that the Lord Jesus came and became like Quasimodo for us. If you remember Isaiah chapter 53, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. This is Jesus. Jesus came and became dependent. God in flesh, infinity, in finite skin, (laughs) experienced hunger. He experienced temptation. He experienced loneliness. He experienced pain, searing, awful pain unto death, rejection, betrayal, And God was all he had. And he had everything. Blessed are those spiritually poor, beggars of soul who know they need God. That's the prerequisite for Jesus' blessing. That's where we begin. And what do they have? What is the present and what is the future dimension of this blessing? Well, Jesus is going to give his kingdom and even himself, and he already has. That's what he says in present tense. Did you hear that? There in verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is, present tense, right now, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And right now, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus very intentionally gives a bookends for his beatitude blessings with a present tense promise. His kingdom is theirs. What is the kingdom of heaven? Remember Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has come near. It's him. He, his reign, his character, his self, his person, his work, all are yours now and forevermore. You who would open your hands and receive him. 
He is yours. And those right now looking to Jesus who mourn, oh, you'll be comforted. I know some of you mourn today. You mourn. This world is full of things that are mournful. Blessed are you who mourn. Jesus promises that you will be comforted at the last day when he brings you home to himself. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those who are gentle, those who don't take things by power and violence, but rather wait on the Lord and receive in faith. This is the Roman Empire, guys. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the strong, right? Blessed are the violent. Blessed are the generals. Blessed are the centurions. Blessed are the spear-wielding, the stone-throwing. Hashtag winning. In America, blessed, right, are the strong. Blessed are the rich. Those with cultural capital. The hashtag winners. But Jesus is the one who, when he was reviled, reviled not in return, but entrusted himself to God who judges justly. Does that look weak? (laughs) When Jesus was struck by a soldier and mocked, and he turned the other cheek to let them strike the other one, was that weak? It's his kingdom in all its power and glory, and it's frightening (laughs) to behold that kind of strength. And Jesus says, blessed are you meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied, who know that something is wrong, and long for the Lord's kingdom to make things right. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The pure in heart will see God. The peacemakers called sons of God. Those persecuted for righteousness' sake. And notice when Jesus expands on the final beatitude, when he said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account or because of me. Then rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven. Notice that he didn't say, blessed are you when others persecute you because you're being a jerk. (laughs) Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, on account of me, on account of identifying with the crucified and risen Lord, the impoverished peasant king from Nazareth. Son of God. Many of our neighbors, when they hear these kinds of words of promise from a God talker like me in a pulpit with an open Bible, think that I'm just offering the world a worthless band aid. Something like Soma, Aldous, Aldous Huxley would say in George Orwell's Animal Farm. If you remember that book, you probably read in high school, perhaps. Orwell was himself a socialist, but critical of the Russian communists under Lenin and Stalin. And he writes this story about the animals on the farm and the way the animals take control. The pigs take control. The terrible hypocrisy involved and all these kinds of things. But in the midst of this, one character is Moses the raven, who represents... (laughs) Christianity and Christian leaders. And Moses the raven promises all the animals that if they're just good animals and they listen to their leaders and they're quiet and just do their jobs on the farm, then they'll get to go to Sugar Candy Mountain one day. And they'll get to eat that wonderful sugar candy sweetness and everything will be all right. And that empty promise you see 
falling flat as you read Animal Farm. But it's sad when neighbors think that that's what Christianity is because in Jesus, there's so much more. But I can affirm, I have to, and I hope you would acknowledge that you have to realize that at times in our love for preacher sneakers and in our hashtag blessed misrepresentation of Jesus and his kingdom, sometimes this is what we're showing the world. Empty platitude promises. It all will be well in the end. You get to go to Sugar Candy Mountain while we show no care for our neighbors suffering right now, so unlike Jesus. There's a few misunderstandings that I would just want to address for a neighbor who had this feeling. First of all, Jesus, if you haven't heard me say it already, was poor. He was dependent. The his, his means of wealth was the generosity, primarily of, of some wealthy women, we find in Luke chapter 8. He was dependent on others. <laughs> he had no place to lay down his head. His disciples after him, the early disciples, were a persecuted minority in the Roman Empire. It wasn't for hundreds of years that they had any sort of establishment cultural power. And that has a lot of... Uh, rightful historical and ethical questions we could ask about it. Jesus was poor. He wasn't coming and offering the world an empty blessing, nor was he promising riches, earthly riches. He was promising a true kind of treasure, the kingdom of heaven. And he was willing to die to purchase that for you. His disciples were willing to die saying they had seen him risen and that that treasure was real, that Jesus and his promise was real. They were willing to suffer for that. It's also sad, secondly, because when we hear these beatitudes, what Jesus blessed, many of us will interpret those beatitudes as weakness, whether it's meekness that we just heard about, whether it's mercy, forgiving those who have wronged us, not claiming the right to exact vengeance and punishment on others, but like God, patiently, patiently giving people room and time that they might come to their senses, that they might see the goodness of Jesus and be drawn to him. It's sad to me when people believe this about Christianity, but it's not surprising. Orwell wasn't crazy. He was just looking at the world that he saw, and that's the sense that he made of it. That's the sense that he made of the Christianity that he saw. We're called, though, as Christians, to show the world something different, to not value the same things that they value, to be a blessed counterculture that values the character of Jesus. And where does that start? It starts by beholding him. They saw him and they were drawn to him. They longed to sit at his feet and hear from him. Today, I would challenge you, dear ones, many of you spend a lot more time being mentored by other mentors who offer you cheap blessing, who offer you anemic character. And some of you are looking at them and becoming what you behold, clicking and scrolling through their memes, listening to the same radio stations on the way to and from work, watching the same stream of news that's actually entertainment, that's actually propaganda, being mentored into the shape of something that's nothing like Jesus, and that does not offer the world light. But Jesus invites you to himself to come and sit, and he would graciously open his mouth. The king of heaven loves you, and he longs to see you experience more. He would bless you that you would be a blessing. That's the way blessing works in God's kingdom. When he blesses you, something happens to you, and you change in time imperfectly, but truly. Salt and light, that's the character of the change that he works in us. 
He will say to you who look to him, the poor in spirit, the beggar of soul, he will say, you are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. That's the way in which neighbors are called, are, are supposed to experience you as salty and as enlightening in some sense. Salt, if we take that image first, salt has basically two uses. If you read in the commentaries, um, occasionally people will get really excited and you'll have like 10 pages on the 11 different uses of salt in the ancient world. But you can boil that down to two and uh, for your sake, um, you have taste and preservation. Taste and preservation. There's supposed to be something that happens when you're around a Christian, there's a taste. When you're around someone who's beholding Jesus, there's a different flavor. It's a flavor that preserves the character of God in the world, that pursues God's values in the world. It's something different. And when Christians lose that flavor, and when they quit preserving God's character and God's priorities and instead preserve their own comfort and their own cultural privilege and power, it's like it's worthless salt that ought to be thrown out. In, in, in the ancient Near East, they weren't spoiled like us with salt that comes in salt shakers that you can get over at King Supers. They would have impure salt with some salt and some other kinds of you know, stone or or dirt mixed in, it wouldn't be perfectly pure. So once the salt had all been licked off and used, you had something that was worthless, just something to be thrown out. He's giving that as an image to say, listen, you're called to a long saltiness. You're called to reflect the character of my kingdom. You're the light of the world, a city on a hill. And it can't be hidden if you set a city on a hill. People don't put a lamp up and then put a basket over it to hide the light. You let the light shine. And so he says, let your light shine before others, that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Note what Jesus said. Dear ones, evangelicals who with me share a love for the word of God and long to see it rightly proclaimed. We care about the words of Jesus but Jesus is talking about your ways. Did you see what his words were? That's not my words. Let your light shine before men that they might see your good deeds. There's supposed to be a different experience of being in Christian community, of being around a Christian. Like when you go to get food with your family on a Sunday and your waiter who has a lot of tables because all the churches get out at the same time. And so all these darn Christians are coming and they are consumers like everyone else in the world, loving the same things that everyone else wants and they want their food now. And they don't care that you're an actual human being, they want their food now. And, and you brought it to me with too much salt. I said not as much salt. Oh, you said not as much salt. I thought you said extra salt, I'm so sorry. Well, forget about it, I'm talking to the manager now, you know? Blessed are the merciful. Christians are called not to be mere consumers of other people and of those around us, but to bless, to offer a different kind of taste, a love that comes from the Lord, a care for people that the Lord would account for that we would probably not remember to. And we forget ourselves that we're the spiritual quasimodos that the Lord reached down to take hold of in love. Not because we had anything to offer, but simply because that's who God is. He is steadfast love. This week, uh, we have encouraged you to give away an invitation to your neighbors and to pray about that. One thing that I want you to hear from me as a pastor say is one of my longings for that carnival and for the conversations that you have with those people that God would call you to invite, would that be an opportunity, a small opportunity, where your neighbors could see that there is something about Christians, some kindness, some different character, some saltiness, some light. 
It doesn't come by forcing it out of ourselves. It comes by looking to Jesus. So this week, as you're looking to Jesus, beholding him, and you're praying about that person, I hope that you would offer them some of his character. (laughs) In our nervousness to try to get all of our words right and to try to have a gospel presentation ready or something like that, sometimes we get scared and so our one interaction with person, we're, we're banking on one interaction. So we've got to get it all into this one time. But my goal, my desire would be that you would have an opportunity to share the truth of Jesus, the words of Jesus, because you win credibility <laughs> through embodying the ways of Jesus over time. Does that make sense? That would be my desire. But to begin knowing this blessing and taking hold of it, something has to happen because the fact of the matter is we like our preacher shoes. We like to look hashtag blessed. We like the things that we have and we don't want to let go of them. We like cultural power. We, we don't like mercy. We don't like, we don't like this stuff. So how, how do we take hold of this blessing? I think of when I was a child, and sometimes even with my children, when they're scared, they might come into my bedroom at night, they've woken up, or, or I woke up when I was a kid. I'm scared, and I go into mom and dad's room, and I say, dad, you know, and they're still asleep. And then, dad. We keep going, dad, and, you know, he's still asleep, dad, you know, and uh, (laughs) he wakes up. What I would long for the Holy Spirit to do in us as we look to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, I would long that he would wake us up, (laughs) that he would say to you, my beloved, my beloved, I've given you treasure Look at what's before you. And he would shake us out of comfort, out of complacency, because we would see the worthlessness of this stuff that we cling to. And we would see the surpassing greatness and glory of Jesus, our King and Savior, who gives himself to us, present tense, promise, now and forevermore. Take hold of him. Wake up. All this junk that we fill our veins and our eyes and our houses with will offer us no eternal hope and offer this world no eternal hope. But Jesus, Jesus, he is worthy. And he would give himself to you. Christians who are here today, I know, I know that some of you are mourning. I know that some of you are facing opposition in your families. I I know that you experience slander, some of you, in your places of work and among your social networks. And people think it's dumb to be a Christian. I was one of those people once. People face it even worse in other parts of the globe, right? But you're blessed right now. Wake up and see it. Jesus is yours. Take hold of him today. Look to him. Behold him. Behold your treasure. And neighbors who would be tempted to think that Christianity is just like offering sugar candy mountain to people in real persecution. If that's you today, I just invite you to take a second look at Jesus with us as we look to this one who says, blessed are the poor in spirit. This one who would be persecuted himself persecuted himself unto death so that you could have a picture of God's love and could come to him and know true treasure. Today, we're going to be able to taste and see some of his goodness as we come together to the table. I just invite you now to take hold of true treasure in Jesus as we pray, and then we'll, we'll come to the table together. Father, thank you that Jesus would come and offer true blessing. Lord, open our hands. We open our mouths and long to receive your blessing. 
Come and be with us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Take this and eat it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also after supper, our Lord Jesus lifted up the cup and blessing it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take this and drink it, all of you, in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul writes that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death till he comes. And he writes that even as Jesus has promised, I'm with you always to the end of the age, that there's a a special way in which Jesus gives his presence to us. When we take of this in faith, Paul writes, this is a participation in the Lord's body and in his blood. It's a special fellowship that we have with our Savior. And he comes, and he is our host. And he comes, and he says, I love you. You have done nothing to deserve what I've given you. You are a beggar of soul, and he comes in all of his riches with all of his treasure, and he would give you himself because he loves you. Come and taste and know his love. And as you feel that bread in your hand, and you can press it in, Know that our very real, very true Savior is that near to you. And as you taste of the juice, know that he is that near to you and his love is that real. I invite the elders to come forward to serve. And we invite you, uh, Christians, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to come and receive uh, of this sacrament and this moment. For those who are not sure about Jesus, for those who uh, haven't, taken your first step into faith, I just invite you to sit back and watch and consider this sign of God's hope and his love for you. And and we'd love to talk with you about baptism and first steps into knowing Jesus. But for the rest of you, sinners, you've sinned this week. You failed this week. You know how poor you are. Come without money and buy. The Lord loves you. He is for you, and he would feed you. So come and receive.